At the heart of our next generation console is our custom design processor, leveraging the latest Zen 2 and Navi technology from our partners at AMD. It's gonna usher in resolution and frame rates that we've never seen before, like never seen before. We're looking at frame rates up to 120 frames per second. 8K capability, variable refresh rate. Wait a second, variable refresh rate, 120 Hertz. Well, these are both pretty awesome next gen console features, but as I'm sure a bunch of you already know, you can experience them already in Xbox One X and even Xbox One S. Yes, these features will gain further utility from the upcoming Xbox Series X release, but the fact is that if you have one of the existing Microsoft consoles and a supported display, you can get an early preview of sorts on how this technology may work on the next gen machine. And actually, uh, putting this into context, this is one of the things that I really like about the work of the Xbox engineers. There's a proven track record here of pushing the video controllers within their consoles beyond the specs of standard display. You can see that across the console generations. Let's go back to the original Xbox here and Soul Calibur 2. Pretty epic stuff here from Namco. 720p was basically the standard for the Xbox 360 era, which kicked off at the tail end of 2005, but three years earlier, back in 2002, Soul Calibur was delivering native 720p on prior generation hardware. 4x3 aspect ratio, yes, but Tony Hawk's Pro Skater hit a full 1280x720 at 60Hz with razor sharp looking visuals. Absolutely fantastic. Enter the Matrix, well how about an actual 1080i output on that one? I mean very few people would have hooked up an Xbox to higher resolution displays but there we are, the support was there. Next gen display features in the current generation, kind of like how Series X features are actually available in current Xbox One machines. Well, there they are, and we've actually got further previous here, and not just with the OG Xbox. The Classic 360 got some heat for not having an HDMI port. It couldn't even output 1080p at all, but its visual options were simply brilliant. As well as supporting analog component, it had VGA cables too that delivered excellent quality results. 1080p support eventually arrived, but, and a bit of a curiosity this one, way back at launch, id Software's own port of Quake 2 ran at 1080p 60 frames per second, even though the console at that time could not output the full resolution frame buffer. The point is though that in the awkward transition between standard def and HD, Microsoft went out of its way to support any and all displays, connection types, aspect ratios and even anamorphic pixels on plasma panels, even retaining that support once HDMI was added to the console with the Xbox 360 Elite. All of which brings us to the current gen Xbox One. Standard HDMI, yes, on the OG set-top box variant at least, but both S and X consoles feature an HDMI 2.0 display controller with a ton of extra bandwidth, enough to push out 4K signals, but also enough to run anything up to 1440p resolution at 120 Hertz. And yes, variable refresh rate support is in there too on both consoles, and these are the same core technologies being mooted for Series X. But as long as you've got the right display today, you can try them out on your existing Xbox. Just as you could run OG Xbox at 720p or Xbox 360 at HD before HDMI was really a thing. Now let's talk about that 120Hz display support, how it is in the here and now on Xbox One machines. Now a totally valid question you might have is simply this, what is the point? There are no games that run faster than 60 frames per second, right? So why bother offering up a 120Hz output? Some might say it's pointless, and well, yeah, I mean, look at this capture head-to-head -head of Rise of the Tomb Raider in high quality mode, which is capped at 30 frames per second. It's 30 frames per second with a 33 millisecond frame time, no matter how you run the game, 60 hertz, 120 hertz, whatever. But you know what? There is an outlier, and its name is Rainbow Six Siege. Load up the game and you can turn off VSync there and in certain areas, specifically the ones not linked to multiplayer, well, you can run the game faster. Standard output on those modes is 30 FPS with VSync enabled, but VSync off also unlocks the frame rate. The game even has a rather nifty frame rate counter there. You can see how frame rate jumps when turning off VSync and, uh, well, when you look at the sky, you're rendering absolutely nothing and frame rate goes even higher. 
but fundamentally you're still getting over 60 frames per second crammed into a 60 hertz output so you're seeing incomplete frames tearing and well overall i don't think it's particularly great but something fascinating happens when you run this game with 120 hertz mode active instead of incomplete frames packed into a 60 hertz feed you're getting all of the visual information the frame rate output by the machine is definitely higher than 60 fps because our performance analysis tools which are based on actual video output well you can actually see there that we're tracking all of the frames there and averaging distances aside our frame rate measurement in the top right there is matching the internal counter on the bottom left what's curious about this is why there's any tearing at all so here's the thing 120 hertz support on xbox one usually has a mandatory v-sync engaged for all content Tearing is completely gone on every single game for reasons I'll talk about in a moment. Except this one. <laughs> it still tears on Rainbow Six Siege, which I actually find a little frustrating because earlier tests last year when I first started looking at this, V-Sync was engaged here too. So you'd have frame rates in the 70s and the 80s and there was no tearing. I kind of wish I could show it to you now, but well, I can't. An intriguing experiment then, but hardly a game-changing one. But we have established that an Xbox One game could be designed around 120Hz output if some developer out there was mad keen on giving it a go. Rainbow Six got an Xbox One X patch with increased resolution but I'd have loved to have tested the unpatched version running under back compat. The 70ish FPS that we're getting here would likely be that much higher. But I guess the question you might have following on from that is simply this. Is the 120Hz output mode of any use at all in standard Xbox games that run at 60 or 30 FPS? And the answer there is no. And yes, <laughs> it varies from title to title. So allow me to explain. On a 60 Hz screen, you get a new image every 16.7 milliseconds, which means that if your game is targeting 60 frames per second, but not hitting it, you have to wait another 16.7 milliseconds until the next frame appears. The game is stuttering then. Look at the frame time graph in Wolfenstein, the new Colossus with dynamic resolution disabled. Every time a frame is dropped, you get that additional 16.7 millisecond pause. But now consider how a 120 hertz display works. The screen updates every 8.3 milliseconds. So if the game has a frame ready, rather than wait 16.7 milliseconds for it to appear, uh, the time you have to wait until the next display refresh is now half that. Now you can see here the actual frame rate hasn't changed but you get less visible stuttering because frame times on dropped frames are cut in half. In short, per frame persistence is lower, so it looks perceptually smoother. This is a classic example of how a standard game can run better in 120Hz mode, even if it's not actually targeting 120 frames per second. Of course, realistically with this game, you turn on dynamic resolution and enjoy smoother performance anyway, so let's take a look at another example where you can't do that. Sekiro. Shadows Die Twice, Xbox One X, unlocked frame rate here, and if there is dynamic resolution, it's not exactly doing much. But it's the same kind of situation we saw with Wolfenstein. Frame rate is uneven, it's unlocked, but per frame persistence is lower on the 120 hertz feed, giving you a smoother ride. And this has benefits also for games that possess improper frame pacing. On console games, this is usually a 30 FPS title that isn't delivering a new frame consistently every 33 milliseconds, but rather doing it in a somewhat arbitrary manner. Sekiro on the base Xbox One S is such a game. It's not unlocked like it is on X. It's trying to lock to 30 FPS, but per frame persistence, not very good here. Performance in this particular area I'm testing somewhat wobbly, and I'm not entirely sure it's for graphics reasons, but still check this out. Typically, incorrect frame pacing sees a 30 FPS game deliver frames at anything between 60 and 50 milliseconds. However, if you run the game in 120 hertz mode, the screen is refreshing twice as often, meaning more opportunity for new visual information to appear closer to the target 33 milliseconds. Rather than a 16 to 50 millisecond window, it's now more like 25 to 42 milliseconds. The frame pacing issue isn't solved, far from it. But the bottom line is it looks smoother and it feels smoother because it is smoother. Fans of the Crisis Trilogy, and aren't we all, might recall from our back compact coverage that while the extra power of Xbox One consoles brought these games up to their target 30 FPS, 
something the 360 couldn't do. There seemed to be a bit of an issue with 16 millisecond frame time spikes adding extra judder. The internal frame rate target may have been set to 33 milliseconds rather than 33.3, but regardless, again, in 120 hertz mode, the display is still refreshing twice as quickly in back compact mode. So the impact of those spikes is lessened. Rather than a 16 millisecond jump there in frame time, we get an 8 millisecond spike instead. Again, it's perceptually smoother, though I am noticing here that those mini spikes, if you like, are more numerous. Another example here we've covered in the past, campaign in the new Modern Warfare 2019 can't quite hit its performance target of a locked 60 FPS. You drop frames, but you also get tearing at the top of the screen. Now what's happening here is that rather than make you wait for the next screen refresh, Infinity Ward sees that if the frame is late by just a few milliseconds, it renders it anyway, uh, reducing latency but causing a tear because the new frame is arriving while the current one is still being scanned out. Run the game in 120Hz mode though and the tearing is gone and you get the benefits of reduced latency anyway, as the screen is updating twice as quickly. However, there is perhaps some evidence here that enforcing VSync, even on a 120Hz display, may have a performance penalty here. You get extra smoothness perhaps, but you may be losing something in terms of raw frame rate. Interesting theory there, perhaps borne out by this analysis of Rise of the Tomb Raider in its high frame rate mode. Eliminating tons of torn frames by mandating VSync seems to hit the overall performance level pretty hard. Flexibility in when a new frame is rendered may cause tearing, but as I said, it gets new visual information to you sooner. Delaying that may hit performance. So an already dodgy performance mode in this game is even less satisfying if you choose 120Hz display output. And games that don't just restrict tearing to the top of the screen can really suffer. They're very small in number, and I guess the classic example from Digital Foundry's test suite has always been F1 2017 here. To maintain fluid performance, when a new frame is ready for rendering, Codemasters will display at mid-refresh at any point, causing a tear. Modern Warfare and Tomb Raider's performance mode only allowed tearing at the very top of the screen, but on limited titles that do tear all the way down, using 120Hz mode is not recommended at all. The head-to-head -head here shows that enforcing VSync in this scenario will see frame rate lock to anything as low as 40fps, when the standard presentation might be a tear fest, but you're getting more visual information more quickly. So yeah, from my perspective, I'd say that in this case, in a game with full screen tearing, you'd be getting a palpably inferior experience unless you really, really don't like screen tearing. So it's an implementation with plus and minus points. And will this be the case for Xbox Series X? Well, I'd like to think that um, Microsoft would allow developers to define their own display modes as they've done for games on this generation at 60 Hertz. And yeah, in the here and now, there is one other disadvantage to using 120 Hertz mode on Xbox One hardware. Uh, kind of like the cost of being an early adopter, if you like, before a spec is set in stone. But it's also where Xbox Series X should shine. You see, the current generation have HDMI 2.0 controllers, enough bandwidth for 1440p at 120 Hertz, but not full 4K at 120 Hertz. So to take advantage of 120Hz modes, you have to allow an Xbox One X to internally downsample a title like Modern Warfare 2019. It is super sampling though, the game is still internally rendering at the higher pixel count, but the actual physical output of the console is limited to 1440p. For the sake of convenience, my tests are actually at 1080p 120, but again, similar principle, you are at least getting super sampled visuals. But yeah, this is where Xbox Series X will have the advantage. It'll ship with a higher bandwidth HDMI 2.1 controller, meaning that 4K output at 120Hz entirely within spec. That extra bandwidth should be enough to support 8K resolution output too. And that's why you have that little 8K symbol there embossed onto the Project Scarlet processor that was recently revealed by Microsoft. And well, what can I say? 120 Hertz is just one of these new next gen display controller features. Variable refresh rate is another, and the idea here is very straightforward. We've talked about judder from dropped frames with VSync active. We've talked about tearing with VSync off, and this is all happening because standard displays refresh at a fixed interval 16.7 milliseconds per frame on a 60 Hertz screen, 8.3 on a 120 Hertz screen. But what if the screen updated? 
when the GPU in your console told it to. In theory, tearing should be eliminated and V-Sync JADA massively mitigated. Let's go back to Wolfenstein and New Colossus at native 4K, DRS off. JADA here is pretty obvious, but with variable refresh rate, which I've kind of had to film here to get some idea of the effect, the screen only updates when the console is good and ready with a new frame. It looks much smoother. I'm not going to talk too much about VRR here because I've already looked at this and there's a video link in the description below where you can see how this checks out. But let's go back to that other display controller upgrade that the current gen consoles can't support at all. 8K resolution, a native 7680 by 4320 pixels, 33 million pixels at 60 frames per second, totally insane. I mean, in theory, there are games that could run at native 8K easily enough, something like Geometry Wars, for example. But some might say that the 8K output modes are likely more future-proofing for ultra, ultra HD media sources, kind of like the way Xbox One S can produce full pixel output for UHD Blu-rays. But 8K gaming? Well, never say never, and I do have some theories about that that I'll be sharing in due course. But let's just say that if you've got a notional 2x increase in teraflops between Series X and Xbox One X, plus those Navi architectural advances, I'd much rather see that extra power go towards higher quality pixels as opposed to generating more of them in a world where even getting great looking 4K 60 games, challenging to say the least. Okay, so let's try to tie this one up then. An enviable feature set with huge benefits to gamers is built into the HDMI 2.1 standard. And even though I have a beautiful LG OLED screen, I think I'll have to update it to an HDMI 2.1 model to get the most out of my next gen consoles. And of course my PC. I mean, LG has added G-Sync support, right? But what I really like about the features available in the current gen Xbox is that I see continuity in engineering tradition. Going back to the early days of Xbox, the firm has pushed the envelope in supporting high-end displays and you can see that lineage continue in Xbox 360 where the firm went out of its way to get the console running in high def on basically anything that would run it before HDMI became the standard. And now with uh, Xbox One S and Xbox One X, cutting edge HDMI features like variable refresh rate and 120Hz are added to the system ahead of time, giving some fascinating effects while at the same time hinting at the support to come on future platforms. 8K though, on the face of it, the concept sounds ludicrous, but yeah, as I said, do have some theories about that. For now though, I hope you enjoyed this one. Like, subscribe, share, you know the score. Doing so will make me inordinately happy. We have a bell there, you might have noticed it. Ringing it means instant notifications whenever we post new content. The DF Patreon, it's there for those that love what we do and want to support us more directly. And in return, you'll get source quality versions of every piece of content we produce. But that's all from me for now. Thanks for making it all the way to the end of this one, if indeed you did. And just generally, thanks for watching and supporting Digital Foundry.